Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 What a joy to be with you once again this glorious week, the week of Easter. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What a God we serve. We remember what happened this day over 2,000 years ago. Jesus was visiting Jerusalem for the final phase of the redemption of mankind. But tonight, I want to welcome you to Digging Deep, where we take adventure in the Word of God. And Pastor Yemi Ogunsoy, uh, with me tonight is not Pastor Dio, but an amazing son, somebody that Pastor Dio picked to stand in for him, uh, for her tonight. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to have uh, with us tonight in this Bible study someone that's been following this online Bible study right from the first day. Uh, one of our ministers, uh, Deacon Wale Omin Tiron. You are thank welcome, sir. Thank you, Daddy. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm glad and uh, I don't take it for granted. It's really an honor. Thank you, Daddy. Thank you, Mommy, also. Amen. Glory be to God. It's, you are going to enjoy tonight. Uh, I know uh, the uh, Deacon is ready. It's loaded with the word, and uh, we're going to turn him loose tonight. Amen. Amen. I'm going to take the leech off, yeah. so <laughs> we want to hear from him tonight. But first of all, can you lead us in a short prayer, please? Uh, let us pray. Father, we thank you. We return the glory and the honor to you. Thank you for grace. Thank you for strength. Thank you for how far you have brought us, Father. Father, tonight we have come to learn at your feet. We ask for wisdom. We ask for revelation. We ask for fresh anointing. We ask that the words that are going to be spoken tonight will be your words and not words of man in the mighty name of Jesus. That these words will touch lives and transform lives in the mighty name of Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank Amen. you so much. Amen. Uh, <laughs> let's get started tonight. Um, mm. Take us through the introduction so that we know where we are. Uh, the book of Philippians, it's, uh, it's, it's a good book. Well, any, every book in the Bible is wonderful. Um, this is a, a book that was written by, it was a letter written to the Philippians, uh, which is one of the four, you know, one of the four letters written by Paul while he was in prison. You know, so he wrote it to the Philippian church. Um, we can look at the other three, um, three books that he wrote, two, three letters, the Ephesians, the Colossians, and the Philemon. You know, Philippian was written, like I said, to the church. Uh, and it was, you know, when Paul was in, the, was in prison, and, you know, he visited the Philippi uh, on his second missionary journey after receiving a night vision, you know. So um, um, the reason, one of the four reasons why Paul wrote these books, you know, for for, for the learning of Christians, you know, the first thing was to thank because the Bible makes us understand that um, gifts were taken to him in prison. So he, he was writing to thank them for the gift that was sent to him at the time. He also was, you know, he used the opportunity to encourage them, uh, to encourage them to look confidently to Christ for their joy and unity. Also to encourage them to continue to preserve in their Christian life and faith. And also, the fourth reason, primary reason why he wrote this letter to them was to assure them of God's faithfulness and commitment to supplying all their needs because of their partnership with him. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So those are the four major reasons why uh, Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. uh, wrote to the Philippian believers. Mm -hmm. And uh, like we always say, if his uh, epistle is good for the Philippians, is good for us in our time. Amen. So we have been looking at this book. We've gone a bit, almost to half of the book. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we have been camping around chapter 2 uh, alongside Pastor Dio for some weeks now. Um, I'll just, we'll just do a brief recap. Maybe you are joining us for the first time tonight and you are wondering what has been said, what has been taught. Uh, there are instructions for you, and uh, we'll be as brief as possible. But tonight, by the grace of God, we're going to close out chapter 2. So from next week, we are going to start uh, chapter 3. The book is only four chapters. So we are, that's why I said that we are almost half of the book complete. Amen. Amen. So in uh, chapter 2, 
uh, we, for the purpose of study, we have separated chapter two into four sections. Uh, we've done three of the sections, so we just quickly go through them. The first section we divided into uh, from verses one to verse four. Verses one to verse four. Therein Paul focused the believers in Philippi on the subject of unity through humility. He began to focus them on the internal problem that Satan is trying to generate within them to stop the church. Chapter 1, he focused on the external aggressors. But in chapter 2, he began to focus their mind on what Satan is trying to use uh, to destabilize the body of Christ. And hey, you know one thing with Satan, his methods never change. Like we have said repeatedly, uh, the, the, the individuals may change. The sins may change, but the plot never change. The same thing he used against the Philippians is still using against the churches of Jesus Christ today. And it will, it will be to our benefit if we pay attention to them. So Paul spoke about unity. In talking about it, remember we said, we, we, he mentioned four things that God has made available to believers. One is the comfort of the Spirit. Uh, second is the, uh, the, the, the encouragement that we all have in Christ. Then the second one, it focused the attention on the comfort that the Spirit of God uh, uh, provides for uh, the love of God provides through His Spirit. Thirdly, He spoke about the unique fellowship, mm -hmm. the getting together that believers have with the Holy Spirit. That's an amazing fellowship, partnership together with the Spirit. Then He focused us on the mercy and the affection that we have in Christ. And it reminded the believers in Philippi that these four things are only available in the body of Christ. They are only available in Christ. The world cannot give this. And since this is only unique and specific to the body of Christ, we should use it to minister to each other. Instead of uh, competing with, with each other, instead of uh, pulling down and tearing and murmuring and complaining, we should see use this gift that God has given us to build each other up, so building up the body of Christ so that the churches can run effectively. That is one of the things we talked about uh, uh, in studying that part of it. And then we move up to uh, the subject of, okay, uh, how humility will strengthen uh, the body of Christ. He advised them to avoid pride. Uh, the way we pick the, the Passion Translation as the version we use because of its simplicity. In one of the verses, he said, we should avoid uh, pride-filled opinions. We should not be condescending to fellow believers. We should see each other as one body to work together. Pride, we were told, is the root of all division. So if we can eliminate pride, there will be little or no division. And the house that stands together will surely succeed. Then in the second section of the book, that's from verse 5 to verse 11, uh, Paul said, painted for us the example, classical and uh, perfect example of the Lord Jesus, our master, in his earthly ministry and what he's still doing, even at the right hand of the Father. He mentioned four things. You remember, he told us about his mindset, that Jesus was not focused on himself. Even though he was the second person of Trinity, he didn't hold on to that glorious uh, uh, position in heaven. He gave it up, came down as a man, lived as a man for 33 and a half years so that he can touch people and redeem mankind. He thought about us and he's still thinking about us. And that, is, that thought made him to serve. Everything Jesus did from the first day he was born as a baby till the last thing he did on the cross uh, was to serve mankind. You remember we mentioned he washed their feet, uh, took towel, wiped it, uh, provide, healed their sick, uh, provided food for them, touched their loved ones. So he's still serving, even at the right hand of the Father. Then we went forward and talked about what service requires. So every genuine and uh, acceptable service requires sacrifice. Service without sacrifice is not service. It's just taking a leisure walk. 
if you are going to serve appreciably in the body of Christ, if you are going to serve Jesus and serve our local churches, then we have to sacrifice. It's not going to be very convenient. You have to, maybe you have to do things repeatedly, consistently, when there is snow, when there is no soul, snow, when you feel like, when you don't feel like, you just keep doing it. So Jesus made that sacrifice. We see that in verses, uh, verse 8. He said he, he, he was obedient even to the death of, of the cross, a criminal's death. That is a sacrifice. He didn't sin, but he took on our sin, and he paid the price three days and three nights in the pit of hell with all the demons of hell gathering against him, ganging up against him. So that is sacrifice. Even at the at this right hand of the Father, he's still serving. The Bible said he still makes intercession for us. He's still interceding for us. That's Hebrews 7.25. And because he's committed to these three things, he brings glory to the Father. The ultimate goal of service and uh, thinking about others, not being selfish, not being prideful, is to glorify God. And because he brought glory to the Father, God gave him the most excellent name, that at his name, every knee shall bow. So in the kingdom, service is the way up. Sacrifice is the price we pay for the honor we enjoy. Jesus paid the ultimate sacrifice, and he has the highest seat. Amen. Amen. So, uh, I don't know if you have anything to say to that, uh, to the, that part of it. Uh, you know, one of the things that always uh, encourages me as a Christian is the fact that, you know, you look at Jesus as your mirror, mm -hmm. you know, and understanding that, uh, you know, a lot of people want to relate with Adam, mm -hmm. you know, but the Bible says in the book of uh, somewhere in, I think, 1 Corinthians um, 14, 45, it says, Adam came just as a man. And Jesus came as a spirit, life-giving spirit, meaning that if you are joined heir with Jesus, you will live life just the way Jesus lived his life. Jesus, you know, made us understand that life is about, according to um, Luke chapter 4, 18, that life is, you know, about love and power. And, you know, about, not just about you yourself, it's about the other person. And that's what the commandment he gave us when they came to him and they said, uh, you know, Moses gave us all these laws and he gave us, he gave us all these commandments. Well, which one do you say is the greatest of all? And he said, you know, you have to love God and you have to love human beings. So sacrifice is about love. And that's why God gave us Jesus because of love. Yes, yes, amen. amen. Thank you for that insight. Amen. And now, uh, the third part of the chapter, Paul began to focus the believers in Philippi on uh, shining like light in this dark world. He began to remind them about what God has worked in every believer, and whose responsibility it is to make those things manifest. If, you know, verse 12 and verse 13, we normally quote them. It is God, uh, work out your salvation mm -hmm. with fear and trembling. And the moment I became a Christian, those are the first few scriptures I got to know, in addition to John 3, 16. Amen. They will remind you of those. So we work something out. Remember, we all keep saying we don't work for our salvation. We work out our salvation. God, through Jesus, worked our salvation in. And the word salvation, we said, is the word sozo, the Greek word S-O-Z-O, which means uh, healing, safety, preservation, prosperity, and everything good in Christ. Everything good. It's a total package. God worked them in. Uh, legally, we have all those things, but experientially, we have to work it out, make it sure, make it manifest in our life. So Paul emphasized that it is, was the responsibility of the Philippian Christians and our responsibility to make those things visible to the world to see, and that the more we do that, the more the world will begin to follow us. We are not to follow the dictates of the world. We are to lead the world. In other words, he called us trailblazers, yes, the pathfinders. Mm -hmm. uh, we are not to just go and copy anything out there. The world is supposed to be copying the church. Yes, sir. Amen. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, when I read this, uh, this part, this Bible verse that says we should walk out our salvation, I realized that working out your salvation is a conscious thing. It's a deliberate thing. You have to, because at the end of the day, you have a mirror. 
which is Jesus, which is the word of God. And, you know, the Bible is full of principles. The word of God is full of principles. So when you're working out your salvation, it has to be deliberate because there's an assignment that Jesus gave to us. Jesus said that, you know, that we should, we will do greater works than he did. So there's a commission, there's an assignment that we have to live as children of light so that because we are inside, outside people and also the world is supposed to, you know, watch us and correct their own life. You know, not us living the life of the world. You know, he said we should not be conformed to the things of this world because we are unique and we are different. Yes. Yes. We are people with a different set of uh, living rules. We follow Jesus. You know, Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. We are to follow Jesus. That's why Paul used him as an example, painted him what he did. That's why they, we have four gospel accounts, four different authors to help us see Jesus in his earthly work and copy him, mirror him, like you said. Then, so the ultimate goal of Christianity is to be Christ-like, to be conformed to the image of Christ. We look at two scriptures last week. We look at Romans 8.29. We look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, that God's desire is to conform us, to shape us, to mold us into the image of Christ. So that we are the Christ. Hey, and listen, uh, the world may not see another Jesus coming down to walk the street of Mississauga or Toronto. You are the Jesus they will see. They are to see Jesus in you. We are to talk like him, act like him, and get his result. To prove to the world that Jesus is indeed the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, and then the power to become, you know what you are saying tonight? Ah. I don't have the power. All this thing they are saying is beyond me. No, the power has been put in you. You are power loaded. You are a loaded Christian. The Holy Spirit is in you. It's the power of that, that will bring the transformation to us. Amen. Amen. So we need to be conscious of he that is in us. The Bible said, I think it's 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. Uh, it said, you are of God, little children, and you have overcome them. For greater is he that is in you than he that who is in the world. There is someone in us. It's not a thing. It's not a feeling. It's the third person of Trinity and is in us. That's the power of the Most High to accomplish and become like Christ, to get Jesus' result. But we need to be aware of him. We need to seek his counsel. We need to follow his leading. And we need to yield to the tool that he was going to use, which is the word of God. The Holy Spirit, Jesus said, he will not speak on his own accord, but he will speak about me. He will receive of mine and reveal it to you. Yes, Amen. Sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You see, one, one of the things that amazes me, uh, you know, Jesus said that uh, when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, that we will receive power. We will receive power to accomplish anything that we desire. As long as it's according to the will of God, the power is there. And Jesus said to us, he will teach us and reveal to us things that we don't even know. But one of the things I found out that a lot of people don't rely on the Holy Spirit. Even as Christians, we tend to rely on our head knowledge. We tend to rely on what the, our great-grandfather told us or what our father told us or the way our father lived their lives. Not understanding that the, there's a power that we carry that is supposed to touch the, uh, you know, the universe. That is supposed to touch unbelievers. Yes, yes. Amen. Amen. And the more conscious we are, uh, of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling presence of God, the Holy Spirit in us, the more like Jesus we become, the more we don't cringe and fear challenges, the more we see opportunities instead of problems in the world. Mm -hmm. yes, because sir. the Holy Spirit doesn't see problems. Yeah. He sees opportunities to manifest the goodness of God. Mm -hmm. God is good and God is in you. Hear me, brother, sister, hear me. That the power of God is on your inside. Yes. You are not just a worm. You are not a nobody. You are not a little you. You are a mighty you. Yes, sir. And God is counting on you. That's why he put the Holy Spirit to get the job done. So we need to get busy with the kingdom agenda. Like you, the scripture you are quoting yes, is uh, Acts chapter 1 verse 8. It's you shall receive power, power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses. witnesses. We are the confirming vessels. Mm -hmm. Witnesses confirm the authenticity, the veracity of things. We are the confirming authority on this earth. 
when whatever we say yes to, is, if we say yes to what Jesus has done, no Satan can say no. Amen. Amen. I love that. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> I like power. When I was growing up, I, I, I just have this fascination with power. I just wanted power. So I dabbled into a number of things. But I discovered <laughs> they are not really power until I came into Christ. Mm -hmm. That is the ultimate power. And the two, we are still talking about the two, yes. the importance of the world. Yeah, we have the Holy Spirit, but without the world. Yes, sir. There is not going to be any manifestation. There is not going to be any conformity because the world is the seed. Yes, sir. The world is light. And, you know, in, um, in, 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 in John chapter 8, verse 12, that we read last week, let's read it again today. John chapter 8, verse 12. Uh, Jesus spoke to them again saying, I am the light of the world. And he who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. So Jesus is the light of life. And we know Jesus is the world. So when I now look at that scripture, I'm going to read it this way. Uh, Jesus said, I am the world of life. He who follows or pattern their life after the word of God shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of God leading them. That's the importance of the world. Yes, sir. And, the, you know, Jesus, you know, said, you shall know the truth, mm -hmm. and the truth shall set you yeah. free. Yeah. And the, the, the word of God is light. Yes. And the word of God is truth. Yeah. Even Pilate asked Jesus, what is the truth? Mm -hmm. And Jesus said, I am the truth. Yeah. And Pilate said, well, if that is, if you are the truth, then I, I have nothing against mm -hmm. you. Meaning that for every time you know the truth, which is the word of God, mm -hmm. there is light yes. that shines in the tunnel. Yes. And the Bible says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. Mm -hmm. So all you need to do is to pursue the word of God mm -hmm. that will give you light into whatever circumstances or challenges that you have. Yeah. So we have the word of God there that we can work with daily, mm -hmm. you know, in our daily life, in our daily experience, mm -hmm. not using the experience of men to live our lives. Mm -hmm. So the light is there for us. Yes. We just need to yes. turn it on. We just yes. need to switch it on yes. to see the end of the tunnel. Yes. The mm -hmm. entrance of his word gives light, and it gives understanding to the simple-hearted. I think that's Psalm 119, verse 130. The entrance, when you let the word of God enter your mind, your heart, when you receive it in its entirety, when you acknowledge its, its authority, when you pattern your life after the word, you get the light of God in you so that you can reflect it to the world. We are... Like mirrors, we reflect light. Amen. Amen. I was excited one of my, when one of my daughters was talking to me about reflection and refraction in physics. <laughs> I was so excited because that's who we are. We, we are to reflect the light of God. We are, and the light of God is the word of God. So we are, the word is supposed to see that light. The, the, uh, another way the Holy Spirit explained this to me, the proof that the word of God works is to be seen in us. You are to be to walk healed and healthy. You are to have your needs met. You are to live untouchable, unmolestable. That is the proof that the word of God works and the word works when we walk it. Even Jesus, we have to even Jesus it. said, "You'll be witness yes. to me." So yes. those are part of the being the light. Yeah. Is your when you are being the light, you are being witness yes. of Jesus, you know, to the whole world. Yes, yes. Amen. Amen. So, we concluded last week um, that life of a Christian is not a pattern or is not a, is a pattern of disappointing ups and downs, mm -hmm. like a yo-yo. <laughs> you are up today, you, who knows who you, where you'll be tomorrow, maybe down or in between. No, that's what Satan lied to us to believe. But what the gospel actually says is that uh, the life of a Christian is a sequence of ins and out. What God puts in, we bring out. We read, we are inside out inside. people. We don't look around trying to catch something there. We look inside and bring out. So that's why I said, I, a good man, out of the treasure of his heart, out of the treasure. God put the treasure in us. We bring it out with saying, with doing, we, uh, we bring out good things. That's who you are. Look inside you. Philemon 1.6 said, by the acknowledging of every good thing in us, our faith becomes effective. 
Amen. Amen. Faith will produce whatever God has worked in you. If you know it's there, you acknowledge it and you give yourself to, it, uh, to the covenant terms of it. Amen. Amen. Today, what are we doing today? Like we said, we're going to close out this chapter and it's um, a great privilege to be closing it out with uh, <laughs> one of our spiritual sons, the Deacon Wally. Amen. Yes, so we are going to focus on verses 19 to the end, to 30. Uh, so we are going to read from 19 to 30. I'm going to, let me see, let's use the Passion Translation. Mm. You want to do the reading? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, verse 19 says, Yet, I'm trusting in, in our Lord Jesus that I may send Timothy to you soon, so I can be refreshed when I find out how you are doing. Timothy is like no other. He carries the same passion for your welfare that I carry in my heart. For it seems as it seems as though everyone else is busy seeking what is best for themselves, instead of these things that are most most important to our Lord Jesus Christ. You already know about his excellence reputation, since he has served along me as a loyal son in the working of ministry. After I see what transpires with me, he's after I see what transpires with me, he's the one I will send to you to bless you. And I'm trusting in my Lord to return to you in due time. 25. But for now, I feel a stirring in my heart to send Epaphroditus because of you immediately. He's a friend to me and a wonderful brother and fellow soldier who has worked with me as we serve as ministers of the gospel. And you sent him as your apostle to minister to me in my need. But now he is grieved to, he's grieved to know that you found out he had been sick, so he longs to return and comfort you in this. It's true, he almost died, but God showed him mercy and healed him. And I'm so thankful to God for his healing, as I was, I, as I was spared from having the sorrow of losing him on, on top of all my other troubles. 28, so you can see why I'm delighted to send him to you now. I know that you are anxious to see him and rejoice in his healing. And it encourages me to know how happy you will be to have him back. Mm. So warmly welcome him home in the Lord with joyous love and esteem him and esteem him highly. For people like him deserve it. Because of me, he put his life on the line, despite, despising the danger so that he could provide for me with what you couldn't. Since you were so far away, and he did, he did it all because of his ministry of, for Christ. Amen. Amen. I love that verse 30. I pray that that will be said about you and me. Amen. He said, because of the gospel, he put his life on, line, on the line, despising the danger, mm -hmm. despising the inconveniences, so that he could provide what the gospel needed. He paid the price. And that's why we are, we are talking about, uh, in, in, in this uh, fourth part of chapter 2, we are going to look at two dynamic and uh, inspiring examples. You know, Paul used himself as an example in chapter 1. And uh, in chapter 2, from verse 5 to verse 11, he talked about the ultimate example. That's Jesus Christ. Then now it's moving to two other examples. Maybe you are hearing me tonight. Say, oh, I'm not Jesus. Oh, I'm, I can never be like Paul. I'm just a believer. Oh, I'm a young man. These two examples, you will see yourself there. Timothy was a young man. He was a believer too. He was not even a 100% Jew. He was a mixed, it was a mixed race. Mm -hmm. His father was a Gentile. His mother was a Jew. Maybe you are saying, well, I'm not religious. I wasn't born in the church. I was born a Muslim. I was born this. I was born that. Then you are an Epaphroditus because he was a Gentile completely. Mm -hmm. Somebody that was not raised in the temple. So you find yourself in one of these two. But they both have one thing in common. They received the gospel. Let's look at uh, Timothy first. That's from verses uh, 19 to 24. Three things Paul mentioned about Timothy. Three things, and those three things, they are amazing qualities. 
the first thing he mentioned was in verse, uh, verse, uh, verse, 20, verse 19, 19 to 21. Let's go back there, verse 19 to 21. Uh, it says, Yet mm -hmm. I am trusting in our Lord Jesus that I may send Timothy to you soon so I can be refreshed when mm -hmm. I find out how you are doing. Mm -hmm. Timothy is like no other. That's even, yes. Let's even look at that. He said, there is, Timothy is unique. Mm -hmm. It's like no other. What makes Timothy to be like no other? Uh, <laughs> one of the things I, you know, I Read realized it first, this. Be, this so the 21. Uh, yeah, so it 21. says, Timothy is like no other. Mm -hmm. He carries the same passion mm -hmm. for your welfare that I carry in my heart. Mm -hmm. For the same passion that I carry in my heart. Mm -hmm. For it seems as if though everyone else is busy seeking what is best for themselves, instead of the things that are most important to our Lord Jesus Christ. So, so it, it seems like Timothy was all about the kingdom agenda, you know, and, and being in the kingdom agenda, just like, uh, you know, God brought me your way, sir. Uh, you, must, you must follow somebody, mm -hmm. and you must know the person's heart. Mm -hmm. And you must do, you know, you always tell me, maybe back, back in the days, when you give me an instruction, I would tweak it a little bit. Mm -hmm. and, you say, and you say, when I give you an instruction, you do it exactly the way I tell you to be. Mm -hmm. So I see Timothy as such mm -hmm. a man mm -hmm. to Paul. You know, he was very close to Paul. Mm -hmm. You know, he understood Paul. He knew the heart of Paul. He could sit down and finish, mm -hmm. finish uh, Paul's statement. So he was in tune, even I would say in the spirit with Paul. Mm -hmm. So he knew the mind of Paul. Mm -hmm. So it was easy for him to carry out and yeah. see the vision of Paul yeah. and run with the vision mm -hmm. of Paul. Amen. Amen. The New King James said he was like-minded. Mm -hmm. See, your mind is the seat of your thinking. You, you, you rationalize, you, you view things. You think about things in your mind. And like uh, uh, my son here said, Paul called Timothy like-minded. They have the same outlook. Mm -hmm. Paul, Timothy only see what Paul sees. Mm -hmm. And I remember this, and I've mentioned it uh, a number of times in the church service. Uh, when we came to the U.S., uh, uh, it's whatever Daddy Talabi says that is right with me. I don't see any wrong with what he says. If he says he's green, I begin to echo his green. It doesn't matter who says white. That is the kind of relationship that Paul had with Timothy. He said there is no one like him. He perfectly understood Paul's mindset. And he perfectly received and believed Paul's mindset. So Paul was, you see that he made a lot of mention of Timothy in the, in the, the, the other books too. Uh, in the book of Acts, you see him talking about Timothy. Yeah, we, we have two books, two epistles written to Timothy, first and second Timothy. It's only Timothy out of all the other people that were with Paul. Why? Because he made the mission of Paul his mission. He was called alongside Paul. What are you doing? Whom are you called to be alongside? You may not have been called to be a Paul. You might not have been called to be a Jesus. But you are definitely called to be a Timothy to somebody. Yes, sir. For years, I was a Timothy to Daddy Talabi. Running with his agenda. Even when I was not given any assignment, I will always be around him with my wife and my children, two little children, then they are, they are adults now. We are there with mommy. We were the Timothy. We were the Epaphroditus. Whatever they need, whatever, whatever they want us to do, that's what we do. That is part of service. It's not when you head a church that you say, I'm serving, or you head the department. Being there, when Timothy was also with Paul in Rome, the house arrest that Paul was, Timothy was in the house. Mm -hmm. Just like, that reminds me of Joshua and Moses. And Moses, yeah. Moses was in the presence of God on the mountain, 40 days, 40 nights. Joshua was by the feet of the mountain. Mm -hmm. Under mosquitoes, harsh weathers, he stayed there. He would not leave Moses by himself. That is the kind of service that Timothy rendered to Paul. That made him to stand out. Yeah, so one of the things that stood out to me here was also is that Timothy understood that it was not about Paul, it was about Jesus yes. Christ. Yes. Because he, Paul's speaking here, he says, 
It says in verse, from verse 21, it says, For it seems as if though everyone else is busy seeking what is best for themselves. Yes. So it's about their self, about themselves, and mm-hmm. instead of the things that are important yeah. to our Lord Jesus. Mm-hmm. Meaning that it was only Timothy that understood, you know, the, the vision that, okay, what we're doing is about Christ. Mm-hmm. It's not even about Paul himself. It's about the fulfillment of what God has put in our hands. So, you know, one of the things I also understand is that servanthood, when you, when you are getting to servanthood mode, nothing else will matter to you. Just like Elisha, you know, when Elijah dropped the mantle and you, like you were explaining to us, you know, he, you know, he went back, you know, did whatever he had to do and he never looked back. It's the same thing. So, because when we read about Timothy, it seems like, he was always visiting Paul, and, you know, it was just about the kingdom, running the kingdom agenda, not his personal, you know, agenda. What, what would Christ do? What would Christ say if he was, in this, if it was in, at this point? Let's look at some scripture. Uh, Timothy was one, the only one, like uh, uh, the minister here has mentioned, the only one willing to be sent to the Philippian church, thousands of kilometers away. In Rome. He said, he's the only one. He said, all the other ones are so busy. He's the other, they, are, they were high do. They were busy, but they were busy with mostly the wrong assignment. Instead of running with Jesus' uh, assignment, making the name known, watching out for the comfort of Jesus' people, the church of Christ, they have their own different agenda. And it was only Timothy that was willing to be sent. Are you willing to be sent? To take on that assignment? But let's look at who Timothy was. The first time we see Timothy mentioned in the Bible is in Acts chapter 16, verses 1 to 4. Let's see Acts chapter 16, verses 1 to 4. This is where we add of Timothy first. And then he came to Derby uh, and Lystria. That was Paul in his second mission, in his missionary journey. And behold, a certain disciple, a certain disciple that will soon become distinguished. But in this introduction was a certain disciple. So he was a disciple. Was there named Timothy. The son of a certain Jewish woman who believed. But his father was Greek. Verse 2. He was well spoken of by Lystria and Iconium. Reputation. Impeccable reputation. His fervency for the kingdom was with people who see the fire of God burning in him. The willingness to take on any assignment. So Paul wanted to have him to have him go on with him. Who wouldn't? No minister will see somebody that's young, that's was willing to go through it, go on a missionary journey. No, that, that is, at times we forget the kind of missionary journey that Paul went through. It was, they were not going by buses. No, they were mostly trekking through caravans through uh, sheep, and you know, Paul gave us a, a list, shipwreck, the crusade they were doing, there was a messenger of Satan unleashed against Paul, always creating problem. Who wants to follow a man like Paul? But Timothy was willing. Paul talked to him about going with him, and he said, yes, sir, ah, I will go with you, sir. It will be a great privilege. Amen. Amen. He said, he, he, uh, what happened? He took him this is this one touched me because I don't know how many young ones will submit, young men will submit to this. And I know my son is hearing this too. <laughs> Paul took Timothy, a young man, I probably in his early 20s, because of uh, and circumcised him. We can look at circumcision in two ways. Yes, sir. The physical circumcision, that somebody will just take razor now and circumcise you. At age of 21, that could be very painful. Mm-hmm. Even when they do it for babies, it's painful. painful. Yes, sir. Now, talk less of an adult. But he submitted himself to that. To this crazy apostle circumcising him. Mm-hmm. Secondly, circumcision is uh, cutting off. That means Paul separated him from his group. Mm-hmm. His Facebook friends, his Instagram friends, his TikTok followers. He separated him unto himself. Things guys his age were, do, were doing that they were like to do, he couldn't do them. But he submitted. Paul circumcised him, separated him unto the gospel, and he followed Paul. Both of them were painful. 
to be cut off from the people, the crowd you run with is painful. To be physically circumcised is also very painful. Amen. Amen. But he did. And he, he followed Paul as a son in the ministry. Yeah, so, so one of the things I, I, I see about Timothy here is character. Mm -hmm. His character, meaning that uh, he, he had the, the, the character that Paul needed, that Paul was looking for. Mm -hmm. Because God had given Paul the mandate, and he needed a man that would listen, that had the, the character, that, I mean, no, the attributes that he needed to be able to run with him. So I see Timothy, I see good characters here. So as, as you know, as, as, as servants, you know, whoever God has called us to, you know, maybe there are secrets that, you know, whoever you are following will put in your hands. Maybe there are, there are, there are documents that they will, they will put in your hands. You must have that character, that good character of a servant, of a yes, servant. Yeah. Yes. So that's what I see yes. here. It was discreet. It was discreet. Uh, uh, now, most of the time, we what what you mentioned make uh, remind me of something that uh, come up in the issue of leadership and followership. Discipleship is a disciple is somebody that's following uh, somebody that's trying to be like somebody. Now, everyone we follow, and you will always have somebody ahead of you. There, as a Christian, there will always be somebody. That's the way God set it up. Everyone we follow as a leader uh, has some measure of limitations. Everyone. The man Paul had some limitation. But Timothy did not allow that to hinder him. He saw the anointed Paul. He saw the call upon his, the life of Paul. He focused on that. Overlook all the shortcomings. Paul, you know, uh, I want to believe that Paul didn't always speak well <laughs> every time. Always get it right. Just like the same thing with Elijah and Elisha. The same thing with Moses. Moses was not an easy man to follow. But Joshua followed him for over 40 years. And the Bible did not say one disagreement between them. So, at times, we think when we are called to follow somebody, that person is, a, is an angel. No <laughs> fault. No. Remember, you too, you have faults. So whoever you are following will have some limitations. It's just understanding the mission mm -hmm. and keeping your eyes on the call and doing everything within your power to help the person you are called to follow. Yes, sir. That is what, this, what, that what we are talking about. Now, if we can comp compare and contrast John Mark mm -hmm. and Timothy, both of them were young men. Yes, sir. You know, John Mark was the cousin to Barnabas. It, 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 it eventually brought that separation between Barnabas and Saul mm -hmm. because of John Mark. Because John Mark couldn't stand the hardship of the first missionary. He didn't complete it. He abandoned them. This is too high. It was mama's boy. <laughs> to go long hours, we have people throwing rocks at you. The man said, I didn't sign up for this. He ran back home. Thank God for maturity that came later on. Because later on, Paul asked them to bring him. Mm -hmm. Say, so bring Luke, bring uh, uh, Mark, because it's useful to me. But at that, mo at that moment, there was a big dispute between Barnabas and, and Paul when they were to start the second missionary journey, Paul said, Mark can't go with us. He's not matured enough. Mm -hmm. Barnabas said, no, he's my cousin. He will go with us. And they separated. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. So, hardship, which we call sacrifice, is part of service. Yes, sir. We must go through it. It's not going to... My son here has gone through some sacrifice, mm -hmm. sacrifices, uh, and he's still going through some. But the more he keeps his eyes on the goal and not looking at the fault of Pastor Yemi or Pastor Dio, the better for him to be used as a Timothy to his generation. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. So may I let this be an encouragement to somebody. Be a Timothy. Run with Christ's agenda. Be faithful in whomever you are called to serve in your local church. I don't know what church you belong to. You are called to serve with a man or a woman of God. Run with them. Help them the best way. Stay with them through the thick and thin. Mm -hmm. Timothy stayed with Paul in jail. Mm -hmm. 
He was not in jail, but he willingly put himself under jail condition so that he can be there with Paul. They can minister to him, take his letters, give him food, cook for him, write things, wash his clothes, make his life comfortable. Amen. That is a great sacrifice. And I don't want it to be lost on us. Amen. 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 Uh, let's look at one more scripture before we move on to uh, uh, the second thing about Timothy. Uh, let's look at First Corinthians, uh, Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. Let's see what it tells us about Timothy. First Corinthians 4, 17. For this reason, I have sent Timothy to you. That's to the Corinthians. Mm -hmm. He was going to send him to the Philippians. Mm -hmm. That's what I said that Paul was always sending Timothy. And it's not that Timothy just, like we were discussing yes, this, uh, it's not that Timothy would just carry a letter, oh, uh, this is the letter from Brother Paul. He said you should read it. No. He takes the letter, preach what Paul put in there in all the churches. He, so he was preaching Paul's messages. Then after preaching it, he would leave the hard copy with them. He was the mouth of Paul. That's why Paul said there was no one like-minded like me. He will not modify like what you are saying. He will not modify the message. He will preach it exactly like Paul. Receive it from God and deliver it. Yes, sir. So he said, For I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways. Mm -hmm. Not... Timothy's ways, Paul's way, what Paul received from Jesus, Timothy received from Paul. As I teach everywhere in every church. Mm -hmm. That's a mighty statement to make about a son. Said, what he's going to tell you is speaking my mind. Mm -hmm. That's what I have uh, taught him. Amen. Amen. So we see the mindset, the servant's mind mm -hmm. that Timothy had. Then we also saw the training. Training. Yes, sir. No, he wasn't born that way. <laughs> Timothy was not born that with that character. He trained himself, mm -hmm. a young man. So age is not a factor in serving. Let's look at uh, verse 22. So verse 22 says, You already know about his excellent reputation since he has served along me as a loyal son in the work of the ministry. Amen. Amen. Excellent son. Mm -hmm. He served. Remember, they said he has impeccable reputation among believers in Derby and in Conium. He was there, disciplined mind. When other young people are all doing all kind of, he was in church. I want to call him a church rat. Mm -hmm. He was always there. Busy about the kingdom, kingdom thing. Whatever the pastor, the local pastor wants him to do, he was there in the youth fellowship. He was there in the prayer meeting. He was there in the maybe choir practice. He was there in the IT, if they have IT in those days, <laughs> picking up people to come to church, dropping them. He was there. Whatever the assignment is. Mm -hmm. This reminds me of a great minister of God in our time now, one of our leaders, our brother Kitmore, Pastor Kitmore, pastor two churches now, one in um, uh, Branson and then one in uh, Sarasota, uh, Florida. What God told him is, serve brother, uh, help brother again, Kenneth again. And for 20 years, mm -hmm. as a young man, young, uh, freshly married, he took his wife. They moved to Tulsa, Oklahoma, and they were there for 20 years ministering to the Higgins. Mm -hmm. Whatever, in his own words, whatever brother Higgins need, they are there. They volunteer, not being paid, volunteer for a long, long time. Until gradually, he began to take over mm -hmm. everything Brother Egan was doing. I have practically seen myself many times when Brother Egan will be preaching. And the Holy Spirit will begin to move and he will say, kids, come and finish the message. Mm -hmm. Why? Because he's like-minded. Mm -hmm. like, and he's taking on the same message of Brother Egan today. Mm -hmm. Taking it to areas that Brother Egan was not able to take it to. That is the continuity of the gospel. Amen. Amen. So we see the training. Yeah, the tra training, training, training to it, it, it takes willingness. Yes. <laughs> yes. You must be you must yeah. want to be trained. Mm. You know, I, I always say this, make this example. You know, back in the days where we sent emails to mommy and no comma 
No, mm -hmm. no comma, no full stop. Just express email. <laughs> and, you know, we just sent her, you know, broom. And, you know, one day I walked into her office and she just looked at me and she says, I, I don't know what's wrong. You people just send me emails, no comma, no full stop. I know that, you know, so I, I took those words, I went back and I, you know, I, I started to learn, you know, I started to do research, you know, how do I write my emails, how do I, you know, and all that, you know. So training is deliberate. You must be willing mm. to be trained, mm. to learn what you don't yeah. know and not take offense. You know, I could have, the other, when I worked into mommy's office, I could have said, ah, uh -uh, is she the only one that went to university? Mm. I graduated too now. But no, I understood that there was a problem somewhere and I needed to fix it and I needed to learn and submit. In so other words, be open to correction. Yes, sir. Be willing to receive correction. Mm -hmm. Many today don't want to be corrected. Mm. You see, the countenance changed the moment you mentioned they didn't do something right. Oh, after all, I even volunteered, so why is it complaining? It should be okay. <laughs> no, no. Paul would not have had that much confidence in Timothy if Timothy was not open to his criticism and correction. Mm -hmm. It's not to pull you down. It's to, a good leader will not pull down the people that God has sent to him. Yes, sir. A good leader wants to pour himself, wants to make the, uh, his, uh, his associates like him. Mm -hmm. That's what, that was what Jesus did with his disciples. Yes, he yeah. poured himself into them. Paul speaking somewhere, he said, I have not held back whatever is need, uh, useful for you. I have taught you everything mm -hmm. that I know. He yeah. said, I'm free. I've taught you everything. So we must be open. Yes, sir. There is no followership without correction. You can't. You can't. You have to be open to be corrected. You may not like it. The Bible said nobody likes chas uh, chastening mm -hmm. when you are being chastened. But afterwards, it develops character in you. Mm -hmm. Amen. Remember Paul. Remember Timothy. Remember Elijah. All these people went through stuff. You have to be open and submit to development. And you don't get there in one day. Yes, sir. Timothy didn't get there in one day. Mm -hmm. Then training must precede performance. Yes, sir. It, many wants to perform today, mm -hmm. but didn't want to go through the training. <laughs> so they want crash program in a nutshell. Remember somebody asked Bishop <laughs> Boy, tell me. In a, tell me in a nutshell, what's the secret of your success? So the man said in a nutshell, there is no nutshell. <laughs> you have to do the hard work. You have to mm -hmm. uh, submit yourself to training and studying. There's no nutshell. We live in a world, drive-through world. Mm -hmm. And many times we want drive-through. But in the things of God, things that will endure the test of time, there is no drive-through. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. You don't go to university and say, well, I want to do drive-through. In six months, I want to, six years, uh, uh, yes. you want to be a medical doctor. Mm -hmm. the, what you are supposed to do in seven years, you want to do it in six months. <laughs> I pray I, you don't be, I don't bring my family to you. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I think that's my clock again. <laughs> so, that's not mine, no. Uh -huh. So, I don't know why we have a lot of clock here. Is it mine? No. Oh, it's mine, no. <laughs> <laughs> hey, give me a little second there. Okay, I got it finally. Uh -huh. That means we need to start rounding up. Yes, Let's sir. look at the third thing that Timothy had, and then we finish this off. I will see if we can finish it up uh, with uh, Dickin Wale again next week. Um, the third thing we see with Timothy is he had a servant's reward. Yes, sir. Remember, servant's mind, mm -hmm. servant training, and then servant's reward. What is his reward? Look at uh, look at how look at what he understood the meaning of service and sacrifice. And two chapters, mm -hmm. two not chapters, two books were written to him. To prepare him to be the overseer of the churches that God set up through the hand of Paul. He took over from Paul. Just like Joshua took over from Moses. Moses. Just like Elisha yeah. took over from Elijah. Mm -hmm. Timothy, even though at a young age, became a, a figure of reference in all the churches. Because when Paul was still alive, Paul was, it was the one Paul was sending. Yes, sir. The reward. What a mighty reward to succeed a man like Paul mm -hmm. to be the preferred choice to carry on the assignment. That's a, a great reward. But don't keep your eyes on the reward. Mm -hmm. Keep your eyes 
on the service. Yes, sir. The assignment. Yes, sir. Keep your eyes on the assignment, on the service. Yes, sir. Many times we look at the reward and we miss what will bring the reward. Yes, sir. It's a process. It's the service. It's the assignment. When you serve faithfully, mm -hmm. the rewards are sure. Yes, sir. So I always pray for people, your rewards are sure. For it to be sure, you need to apply yourself to the demand to yes. make it sure. Yes. Amen. 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 Mm. Amen. Amen. That's verses 23 to 24. to 24. Let's just read it as we close out today. It says, after I see what transpires with me, is the one I will send to you to mm. bless I you. Say that, I say that like this. <laughs> after I see what transpires with me, Timothy is the one. Mm -hmm. He's the one. He's the one. It's the choice. It's my choice. Paul was affirming him. It's my choice. He is the one. Yes, sir. Mm. So it's even, it says to bless you. Mm -hmm. Meaning that servanthood, when you serve, yeah. when you serve diligently, you carry, you know, double of the blessing. Mm -hmm. So, and it says, verse 24 says, and I'm trusting in my Lord mm. to return to you in mm. due time. Amen. Amen. So Timothy had great joy mm -hmm. serving alongside the great man, Paul. I believe when I get to heaven, I want to shake Timothy's hand for being there. Amen. Amen. One of the few, I've not always given to regret, but one of the things I regret is I didn't get to know this thing about Jesus Christ at a young age. I was already an adult over 30 years before I became a Christian. What if I had become a Christian at 16, 17? Yes, sir. What a lifetime of joy. I, when I read about people getting born again at eight years old, I, I kind of envy them. Because that means all their life, they serve Jesus. That's, that's like Timothy now. Amen. Amen. Maybe you are hearing tonight, you are sitting beside your parents. And you are saying, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm just a young, I'm just a teenager. No, you are the kind of people God is looking for. Yes, sir. You are the Timothy that God is, you are the Titus that God is looking for. All you have to say is like Isaiah, Lord, I am willing. I'm available. Whatever you want me to do. And I can bet my life on it. He will come to you. He will talk to you. He will use you. He will equip you. And he will bring you honor. Amen. Like he brought Timothy. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Once again, we couldn't finish this chapter two. <laughs> what are we going to do? We have to continue <laughs> next week. Uh, next week, is gonna, is gonna, we're going to finish chapter 2 and start chapter 3. Amen. At the same time, uh, because we'll be talking about Epaphroditus, yes, another sir. great minister, example for us to emulate. Amen. So tonight, we have seen Timothy. Timothy, Timothy, the man Timothy, that became a great man because of his partnership, his studentship under Paul. Amen. And uh, we have learned a lot of lessons. So it's been great honor and privilege to have uh, thank, thank you, Daddy. Wale here. Thank you want you, to Daddy. talk to people. Yeah. Uh, it's a great pleasure, you know, to be sitting here with you. Like I said in the beginning, thank, thank you so much for the opportunity. Mommy, thank you. I don't take it for granted. I know uh, we, are, we are tools in God's hand, which God is using you for us. And I know your anointing will never run dry. Amen. 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 Now let's say a word of prayer. And we look forward to having you join us again next week, Tuesday. Uh, Father in heaven, we just bless you. Amen. Eternal rock of ages, we worship you. Hallelujah. All that has been said tonight, Father, by your spirit, expound it in the heart of your people. Amen. In the quietness of the night, Amen. let your voice be heard. Amen. Take it beyond the voice of a man. Amen. Open unto them the revelation Amen. and the deep things of the kingdom. Amen. For everyone that needs a touch of heaven tonight, whether in healing or finances or uh, giving direction, Father, we trust your spirit to minister to them tonight. Amen. We send the word they need, O oh Lord, Amen. and we call them established. In Jesus' marvelous name, amen. amen.